Let's set the scene. You're back in late 2003, and you've got your mindset on building a computer. So you pick up a copy of Computer Shopper Magazine and get to reading. Soon enough, you're neck deep in the month's latest matchup between Team Red and Team Green, or Blue and the other green. You rack your brain on the growing argument between the flexibility of CRTs and the desk space savings of an LCD. Lastly, you laugh at that silly flash memory based storage that's absolutely never going to catch on. As you put down the magazine, you're dreaming of putting your brand new Athlon 64 and Radeon 9800 in the Antec Landboy and sitting down to play some Vice City, and soon enough, Half-Life 2. Then you wake up from your reverie and remember that the only things inside your wallet are a couple pieces of lint and a blockbuster card. Oh well. But wait, ATI has just the thing for people just like you. Hot off the wafer line at a price of just around a hundred bucks, you can get yourself this. The Radeon 9200. Okay, let's come back to the year 2022 now. There's only so many 2003 topical in-jokes I can make in good faith, given that I myself was only about five years old at the time. At the time of our little flashback session, ATI was flying high. The Radeon 9000 series was a massive success for the company, starting with the revolutionary Radeon 9700 Pro and continuing with other models in the 9700 and later 9800 lineups. At the core of this success was their R300 architecture, which brought massive efficiency and performance upgrades over the previous R200. While the R200 powered Radeon 8500 marginally eked out wins against GeForce 3, the Radeon 9700 absolutely wiped the floor with Nvidia's best at the time, especially when you enabled anti-aliasing. This was made even more impressive when Nvidia's next generation GeForce FX dropped about like a dog drops a turd on the carpet. If you were around at the time, or caught up to speed later on, that's all stuff you probably already knew. But as it's usually told, it's only part of the story. In particular, the part of the story that can be told by the flagship parts. It makes sense that those are the parts that get the spotlight. They're usually the first to release. They're also the ones that show the peak of the technology and produce review graphs that everyone can drool over. But it's not what most people actually could get their hands on. If you're not one of the lucky few, then or now, you have to wait for the lower tier models. These are usually the same architecture as the flagships, but cut down in various ways in order to meet their intended price point. And as mentioned at the beginning, and in the video title, it's one of these lower tier models that we're looking for. So let's take a look at the Radeon 9000 family from the top down. The R300 itself powered the Radeon 9700 series, the launch day flagship. Soon after, it was slightly tweaked into the R350 for the 9800 series. These really were groundbreaking cards for the time. But they've also received a groundbreaking amount of media coverage over the last 20 years. There's nothing new I can add to that. Let's keep going. One step below the 9700 family, we find the 9600 family, based on RV350. In short, this is the full R350 core, but cut in half and put on a more efficient process node. At about half the price of the flagship cards, these still provided an excellent value proposition. I had one of these myself back in the day, purchased with the specific purpose of letting me play Need for Speed Underground. Below that, we find the 9500 with R300 again? Yeah, it took ATI a while to get the RV350 ready for production. Their interim solution was to release the 9500 using the full silicon. ATI just took the 9700 design, cut the memory bus down, and sent it to market. It would only last on the market for a few months, but was in heavy demand for long after given that these provided performance way above that of their replacement. But now we've run into a problem. 
RV350 is as small as the R300 series ever got, at least in terms of discrete designs. So how do we get all the way down to the Radeon 9200? Did they downclock something to hell and back to hit a lower performance point? Well, yes, but also no. So, a quick side note here. Have you ever taken a look at this Wikipedia article? You probably have. But have you ever looked at the section for the RX200 cards? This generation is technically supposed to be GCN2 based. And sure, there's definitely some GCN2 here. But there's also GCN1, GCN3, and Terrascale 2. That last one dates back to the HD 5000 series three generations prior. Needless to say, AMD is not afraid to make their product lineups a complete mess. This may be the most egregious case of that, but it's not the first time, or the last time for that matter. In fact, if we go back in time, say 10 years from here? Ah, there we go. There's the Radeon 9200. The apple really doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? What does this mean? It means that the 9200 is missing what the 9 in its name is supposed to mean. DirectX 9 support. ATI may have marketed these as DirectX 9.0 compatible, thanks to a loophole that Microsoft wouldn't close until DirectX 10. But the fact that there's only support up to Shader Model 1.4 doesn't lie. It's simply missing all the shiny new features and optimizations that came along with R300. From a modern point of view, this would feel unforgivable. But honestly, this type of behavior was common back then. The mobile version of Radeon 7000 was stuck on DirectX 6 for some reason. GeForce 4 MX chips were stuck all the way back on DX7 thanks to being based on the GeForce 2's architecture, and even the GeForce FX cards had their own caveats with DX9 support, all the way up to the top of the product stack even. So, this is the Radeon 9200, or to be more precise, the 9200 SE but we'll get to the details of that later. And this is the RB280 core, the final member of the R200 family to reach the market. But despite how big of a deal I'm making about this, this wasn't the first or even the last R200 card in the 9000 series. First came the 9000 and 9000 Pro based on the RV250, then came the 9100, which actually used the full fat R200 core from the Radeon 8500 for some reason, this 9200, and even in 2004, just a few months before the R400 based cards would hit the shelves, there was a Radeon 9250, also based on this RV280. Why, ATI? Anyway, in this RV280, we're looking at a core with four pixel shaders, a single vertex shader, four texture mapping units, and four render output units. That's compared to the original R200 at 4284, respectively. And yes, this means that the 9100 was a much better card despite having a lower model number and, as far as I can tell, reaching the market at the same time as this. I don't even want to know who came up with that idea. If this were the standard 9200, this would be running with a core clock of 250 MHz and a memory clock of 200. But I did say this is the 9200 SE. Clearly that means it's a special edition. But how's it special? Well, it's a half height card. That's cool. But also, the core clock is 200 MHz and the memory clock is 166. Oh, and instead of a 128-bit memory bus, we get our 128 MB of DDR1 RAM over a 64-bit bus. Hope you're feeling special because I sure am. By this point, you may be praying to whatever deity you may or may not believe in that this was not sold as the same thing as the full 9200. And luckily, you seem to be right. I said at the beginning that these cost about a hundred bucks when new, 
but for this SE model, that seems to have been more like 50 bucks at retail. And realistically, you would have been more likely to find one of these in a budget pre-built than on a store shelf anyway. But regardless of how you obtained it, this would have been the cheapest way into a card with the Radeon 9 series name on it. But was it worth buying just for that name? Now that's a question worth answering. So, how are we testing that? With hardware as representative of a low-budget 2003 build as I can, this means a Pentium 4 1.8 Willamette on an original i845 DDR motherboard, 512 megabytes of DDR266 RAM, and of course, Windows XP. Service Pack 2 isn't quite period correct, but no one, even in the most pessimistic of flashbacks, should be exposed to pre-SP2 XP. For comparison, we have a Radeon 9600 XT to show what you could have gotten with just a bit more money, as well as two contemporary Team Green counterparts, the GeForce MX4000 and the FX5200. Several other relevant cards will be subjected to the same benchmarks, courtesy of several online friends. As for the benchmarks, we're looking at an adapted version of my suite developed for the Battle of the Low Wind series. That means we're looking at 3D Mark 2001, Half-Life 2, and UTO4 as usual. However, 3D Mark 2005 has been traded out for 3D Mark 2003 because 05 wants DX 9.0C support, which ain't happening with these cards. But with all that said, let's get to the benchmarks. Starting off with 3D Mark 2001, we find the 9200 at the literal bottom of the chart, but nearly at the metaphorical bottom as well. The only slower cards are the GeForce 4 MX4000, held back by the extremely restrictive 32-bit memory bus, and the iGPU from an Intel 845 chipset, held back by, well, everything. The closest match is the GeForce 4 MX440, which is nearly the same card as the MX4000, but with a 64-bit bus. Most of the other cards are in a whole other league, even the Radeon 9100, which, as a reminder, is based on the full R200 core. It nearly doubles the performance on offer, while not being significantly more expensive back in the day. Looking at Game 1 in 3D Mark, it doesn't really change the story. Though you may notice the scores on the lower end are a bit closer than they were in the overall scores. What's up with that? Oh, that is what's up with that. There's our first contact with the hell that is DirectX feature levels. 3D Mark 2001 is technically a DirectX 8 benchmark. Game 1 is kind enough to stick with old school fixed function shaders. Game 4 does not. It uses the full gamut of DirectX 8.1 features, leaving all the fixed function hardware in the past. Not that it's much kinder to the low-end DX8 and DX9 cards. Our Radeon 9200 clocks in at less than half the frame rate of its R200 Big Brother, one-sixth the frame rate of the R300 flagship, and one-eighth the frame rate of the Range Chopper GeForce FX card. The embarrassment continues in 3D Mark 2003. The DX7 cards fall way behind due to only being able to run one out of several tests, and the Intel iGPU doesn't run any at all. Even the R200 cards take a hit, since this 3D Mark does try to run a few DX9 tests. But other than that, the data starts making a bit more sense overall, with scores lining up more or less exactly as either GPU vendor intended within their respective product stacks. Now that the DX7 cards are out of the running, the closest competitor for the 9200 SE is the FX5200. This should be no surprise, as the two cards were intended to fill the same market niche. Unfortunately, the results are not looking too favorable for the 9200. It's worth noting here that this FX5200 is also memory bus limited in the same way as the 9200 SE. This was intentional when picking cards for testing, as to make this a fair fight. 3D Mark 03's Game 1 presents us with our last GeForce 4MX compatible 3D Mark test, as those cards just barely present enough feature support for it. As such, those cards put up an almost respectable showing, but still well behind the rest of the pack. 
Meanwhile, the 9200 has mostly caught up with the FX5200. As a side note, the 9100 nearly matches the 9550, an RV350 card. R300 does not provide much of a boost for these fixed function workloads. Moving on to game 2, it's a familiar story. DX6 and 7 are out, R200 is slow at Shader Model 1.1, and the FX5200 beats the 9200SC by a healthy margin. All that changes is the margin by which the flagship cards run away with the prize. At this point, I think we've gotten all the useful data we're getting out of the 3D Mark tests. And it's not like the performance in them matters too much, because no one has ever entertained themselves all night with 3D Mark runs. Okay, that's a massive lie. I had fun running these while drinking a beer or two. Anyway, let's see some more representative data. Ooh boy, this is going to be a fun one to explain. I'll just leave you a moment here to really absorb the level of chaos we're looking at. Okay, got a headache yet? Let's take a step back and explain the two main contributors to this madness, DirectX feature levels and system bottlenecks. This very early version of Half-Life 2 has multiple different modes for different DirectX levels. DX9, DX8.1, DX8, DX7, and DX6. And guess what? We're using all of them here. And no, this isn't a typo. The FX cards, despite being DirectX 9 compliant, mostly, run Half-Life 2 in DX8 or 8.1 mode by default. This isn't a new discovery either. Search this up and you'll find plenty of forum posts complaining about it. Inside those posts, you find two facts. The first is that this was intentional from Valve due to major performance problems. The second is the magical command line incantation to make Half-Life run in DX9 mode anyway. Could I have used this for benchmarking? Sure. Should I have? In my opinion, no. Given the fact that we're also testing hardware that is truly limited to even older DirectX versions, it seems best to present the data as a normal player would have experienced at the time. Do keep in mind though, that there is a big difference in what the different GPUs are having to render here. Our second problem isn't quite as relevant to the low-end cards we're supposed to be discussing, but still worth mentioning. The high-end cards here are getting bottlenecked. Badly. The slow pension 4 and glacial RAM clocks we've got going on here are in no way equipped to keep up with high-end GPUs. This is why you see some weird results where mid-range cards are significantly outperforming the flagships. This also played into the 3D Mark results, but wasn't quite as obvious. Anyway, enough side notes. Back to business. Even with the DirectX madness, it's clear that the 9200 SE is… not fast. The 9100 is well ahead to no surprise, and so are the R300 cards despite running a more intensive test. We should probably ignore the GeForce 4 MX results, but the FX cards are running at a similar feature level, so let's work with that. The 9200 and 5200 are within margin of each other, which is actually a nice surprise given some of the 3D Mark results. In the water hazard test, the results are their own flavor of… interesting. One has to assume that the water effects in Half-Life 2 are really intensive in DX9 mode. That, and the physics are intensive on everything. The 9200 doesn't actually do too bad here, all things considered. It's ahead of the FX5200 by a decent margin, and on the way to even matching the 5200 Ultra. Also close to the 9550, but that's still not a fair fight. Nova Prospect is honestly a repeat of what we saw in Point Insertion. The numbers change, but the conclusion doesn't. 9200 slow, 5200 also slow, DirectX 7 is easy mode, everything else leaves them in the dust. Let's move on? Let's move on. Unreal Tournament 2004 actually cuts down on most of this chaos, in that it doesn't have a DX9 code path to contend with. All the ATI cards and the GeForce FX cards are running on DX8.1. 
the DX7 code path also doesn't seem to be drastically cut down, unlike in Half-Life. On the Anubis demo, the 9200 actually does pretty well, but on the other hand, all the cards scored within a surprisingly tight margin. Except for the poor little MX4000, of course. This map just doesn't seem to be particularly GPU-bound to begin with. The 9200, 9100, and FX5200 scored within a few frames of each other, and all the higher-end cards are grouped together as well. The Avarice test is a bit less forgiving. It sure didn't forgive the 9100, which committed the cardinal sin of only having 64 megabytes of VRAM, or the GeForce 4 MX cards, which committed the sin of being shit. The 9200 technically escaped unscathed, but it still falls far behind the pace of the FX5200, and even further behind the pace of everything else. Lastly, we have the Desolation test. The 9100 has recovered to its expected position in the stack, but the 9200 has actually lost its own. Not only is it still trailing the FX5200, but it's even trailing the MX440. Admittedly, the MX is only having to contend with DX7, but Unreal Tournament honestly doesn't make much use of DX8 features to begin with. So, what have we learned here? I guess I should start with the question I led into the benchmarks with. Is the Radeon 9200 SE worth obtaining? On face value, no. Throughout the benchmarks, it usually fell behind the FX5200 and sometimes even the MX440, though this admittedly usually had the cheat to get there. But there is one more chance that I can give the 9200. Early in the lifespan of the R200 family, it was well known, controversial even, that ATI's drivers were less than stellar. By the time this card came out, that should have been completely straightened out. But for the sake of argument, Let's say that NVIDIA's drivers are more efficient than ATI's, and that this sad little 1.8 GHz Pentium 4 was dragging the Radeon cards down with it. That's why I've now put a 2.2 GHz Northwood in this machine, and even given it a teeny tiny little 5% overclock for a core clock of 2.3 GHz and RAM running at DDR280. So let's give UTO4 one last shot. And... Nope. I had to try. When I decided to name my YouTube channel Tech Left Behind, what I meant by the name was that I wanted to tell the story of the hardware that's come and gone and that no one, even in the retro tech community, is giving any thought to. In other words, the tech that's been left behind. In doing so, I want to give some level of redemption to this hardware and talk about how it's a hidden gem or how it brought us here today. Both the Radeon 9200 SC, that's kind of hard to do. There's just nothing to recommend there. The performance is bad by any metric, and it doesn't really fill any sort of niche either. If you want a DirectX 8 card, you should get the Radeon 9100, or any other R200 card that doesn't have the memory bus cut in half. If you want a tiny little Nugget card that has DirectX 9 compatibility, that's where the FX 5200 comes in. So, where does that leave this video? I guess it leaves me with recommending that you don't pick up a Radeon 9200, at least not in the SE configuration. But it's not like anyone was gonna be looking to buy one of these anyway. You don't buy this type of card. You end up with one or two or three. That's of course how I got mine. They were in a lot I found on Craigslist included with other cards that were actually worth buying. But when you do end up with this type of card, maybe it's worth putting aside the crown jewels of your collection every once in a while and playing in the mud for a bit. It's a nice change of pace. Thanks for watching. that has DirectX 9 compatibility, 
That's where the FX5200 comes in. Holy shit, I did it! Okay.